and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Fort McHenry National Monument and Historic Shrine. There are 419 sites in the National Park Service, and Fort McHenry is the only shrine. That tells you that something important happened here. Now, before we begin, I want to uh, do a little side note. 50 years ago this very day, Apollo 11 had already set off to go to the moon. Four days from now, a flag, a little bit smaller than this one, but with 50 stars and 13 stripes, was planted on the moon. Imagine the, technologi the technological achievement to get that done. So that flag and a couple other flags are still on the moon. That's the, another version of the Star Spangled Banner. And what is Fort McHenry? We're the birthplace of the Star Spangled Banner. So all the feelings we have for that flag that start here in 1814 go all the way to the moon. Think about that in the next couple nights uh, when you look up at the moon and think of 50 years ago, men were walking around up there and put one of these up there. What we're gonna be doing this morning is something they've been doing at Fort McHenry for over 200 years and something that we do twice a day, weather permitting. We're gonna be changing the flag. Well, Ranger Ray, what do you mean changing the flag? You got a perfectly good flag up there, you just pointed to it. You know you got a good flag up there. Why do you have to change it? Well, as a matter of fact, Ranger Ray, why is that flag already up? Was that flag flying here overnight? Yes, it was. That flag was flying overnight because we are required to have a flag flying at our flagpole 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Why is that? Because we like flags so much here at Fort McHenry? Well, we do love flags here at Fort McHenry. We love the American flag here at Fort McHenry. You cannot work or volunteer with, at Fort McHenry without at least developing an affinity for the American flag. But that is not the reason that we have the flag flying constantly at our flagpole. In 1948, President Harry S. Truman Anybody know what the S stands for? Nothing. It stands for S. Yeah. It's his entire middle name. You knew that, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. All right, good. I usually get older geezers like myself to give that one. I'm surprised. I'm very. I'm impressed that you would know that. All right. So 1948, President Truman. Now, the S is actually his entire middle name. It's a compromise between his mom and dad. So in 1948, President Truman issued a presidential proclamation that Fort McHenry, because of its association with the Star Spangled Banner both the song and the flag, must fly the flag here every hour of the day, every day of the week, every day of the year. Now we were the first site to do so because of a presidential proclamation. There are actually four other sites throughout the country that fly the flag constantly day and night uh, due to presidential proclamation. Uh, they would be the Marine Corps Memorial down at Arlington National Cemetery, all U.S. ports of entry, the Washington Monument, and can anybody guess what the last one would be? Is it White House, yes. Right. Now, there are these are the only five sites that fly the flag constantly because of presidential proclamation. There are uh, other sites throughout the country that fly the flag constantly day and night. Uh, the Arizona Memorial, Pearl Harbor, uh, Valley Forge, the U.S. Capitol, uh, and many other sites. But they fly the flag for reasons other than presidential proclamation. Now, the flag we have up, as I mentioned earlier, is a 50-star, 13-strike modern-day flag. Uh, the dimensions of this flag are 5 feet by 9 feet. We put that flag up overnight because unlike in 1814, when the soldiers lived here, we as rangers and volunteers do not live here. So if we had gone home and left a bigger flag on the flagpole and a sudden storm were to come up, which happens very frequently uh, in this area this time of year, uh, that could put so much stress on the flagpole, it could damage the flagpole. If that flagpole is damaged, we could not fulfill that presidential obligation of having a flag flying constantly here at Fort McHenry and we would not be able to put up historic flags for you visitors to enjoy. Now, if a flag is flying at night, what has to be done to it? Let's be able to be lit up. That's very good. I'm, a lot of guys, a lot of y'all knew that. Usually I have to make lots of reasons or hints, but y'all knew that, I'm very impressed. Uh, so a flag flying overnight has to be lit up. We follow that section of the flag etiquette code. On top of the Sally Port, we have LED lights. Uh, they are powered by solar panels on either side of the Sally Port. So if you're on the cruise ship going up, you know, down the Patapsico or coming back or in the 95 tunnel, uh, you can look over and see the flag illuminated here over the ramparts at Fort McHenry. Now, as we fulfill that presidential obligation this morning, 
you're also going to be recreating the historic moment that makes Fort McHenry a historic shrine. September 13th, 1814, down beyond where that bridge is today, that bridge is four miles away, there was a fleet of 55 ships of His Majesty's Royal Navy, the largest and most powerful navy in the world at that time. On that morning of the 13th, 17 ships come beyond where that bridge is today. And so you have an idea how powerful that, navy, that uh, fleet was. The American Navy only had 16 ships in the entire fleet. So more ships than in our fleet were between here and the bridge on that morning. Five bomb ships and a rocket ship anchor two miles away, half the distance to the bridge. 6.30 that morning, they begin a 25-hour bombardment of Fort McHenry, flying 15 to 1,800 bombs and rockets at the fort. At least 400 of them land here within the parade ground. Now, three miles away, aboard an American ship that's tied to the British command ship, was a man named Francis Scott Key. He had gone out to secure the release of a friend who had been taken by the British. He and another friend by the name of John Skinner were successful in getting the British to agree to release their friend. But the British general told them, listen, we can't just let you go. We've been freely discussing our plans for our attack on Baltimore. And we are sure that you have overheard everything we've had to say. So we can't let you go and risk that you're gonna tell everybody what you've heard. So you will be detained until after we've taken Baltimore. That's why he is out there. He watches that bombardment from the very beginning. Now the flag he saw flying here at Fort McHenry was a 17 by 25 foot flag, 15 stars, 15 stripes, made of wool. As the morning progressed, it started to rain. As the day went on, it started to rain even harder. But he does say he saw the flag again at the twilight's last gleaming, but then at night, it was dark. He could not see the flag. The only way that he knew that the Americans still had Fort McHenry was from the bombs bursting in the air and the rockets making the red glare. As long as the British are firing at Fort McHenry, he knows that the Americans still have possession of the fort. It rained very heavily during the rest of that night. On Wednesday, September 14, 1814, at 7 o'clock that morning, it stopped raining, but it was still very cloudy. He could not see the flag. And then at 7.30, the British stopped firing. As Key describes it, it is dread silence. Why have they stopped firing? What does it mean? He could not see who had Fort McHenry because he could not see the flag. Why couldn't he see the flag? Because of the clouds and the rainstorm, because of the smoke from the cannons and the bombs hanging over the fort. And that wool flag, after a heavy rainstorm, would have been hanging limp against the flagpole. So in the first line, when Key is asking, oh, say, can you see? He's not being poetic. He's actually asking the other men on the ship, can you see the flag? Because I cannot. And then at nine o'clock, 90 minutes after the British stopped firing, he sees something happens in the fort. At that time, a 17 by 25 foot limp, wet, soaking flag, hanging up against the flagpole was taken down. A much larger flag, 30 by 42 feet, was hoisted from this very spot. As that flag is to the top of the flagpole, the rain clouds disperse, disperse. The smoke blows away, and the sun comes out and shines on that flag. He sees that flag shining in the sunlight and describes that moment like this. Now it catches the gleam of the morning first beam in full glory reflected, now shines in the stream. This is the star-spangled banner. Oh, long may it wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave. When Key gets the inspiration to write those words from the second verse, that becomes a historic moment that makes Fort McHenry a historic shrine. As I mentioned, we're the only site in the National Park Service that is a historic shrine. So what we're gonna be doing this morning we're going to be recreating that historic moment. We're going to be taking down our modern day storm flag. I do not have enough winds to put up the big flag, unfortunately. 
but we're going to do the second fast thing. We're going to put up a replica of that storm flag, the flag that Keith saw at the Twilight's um, last leave. Yeah. Very good. We need a whole lot of people over here. Uh, do we have any active military or veterans uh, here today? Uh, would you all mind help taking down our overnight flag, sir? Here at Fort McHenry, we do everything possible to make sure the flag does not touch the ground, but sometimes it does. Now, the whole thing about destroying a flag if it touches the ground, it's all about intent. The best way to remember if a flag needs to be disposed of or not after it touches the ground is this. If mom or dad are putting up the flag for the 4th of July barbecue and they drop the flag, they do not need to put it on the barbecue because that flag was being treated with respect. However, if mom and dad pick the flag up, roll it in the ball, jump up and down on it, spit on it, curse at it, that flag was disrespected and that flag should be disposed of. Do not put a nylon flag on your barbecue. <laughs> All right, I need to see which way the winds are gonna go. So, see. They didn't have these in 1814, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> okay. South South East. East. okay. So where are you all from? Everywhere. 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 Is that a new state? We getting a new flag, a new, a new yeah. car for that one? It's called the United States of America. Oh, very good. I like that. All right. So we're going to try to get the flat, the blue on that side. All right. Very, you guys did it right on the first time. Absolutely. That's great. All right. Take about four steps towards me, please. Actually, no, you didn't. I want the blue on this side, so we're going to switch sides. Going back, going back, going back. Going back. Right, yeah. I want the blue, but I want the blue field over on this side. Yeah. All right, just pass it under. Pass it under. All right, good job. Who were all of you students when I was teaching? All right, take about four steps this way, please. All right, that's good right there. All right, now, as I mentioned, this is the flag that flew during the bombardment. This is 17 feet by 25 feet. Uh, a pretty old flag that's made of wool. So he is arrested and brought here, and he is not told why. 
His friends are not cold blooded. So he goes all the way up to the Supreme Court to a man named Roger Taunty, Chief Justice of the United States. Sound familiar? Yeah. Remember the Dred Scott decision? Yeah. Yeah. That's what he's infamous for, right? Well, yeah. guess what he is? Guess what else he is? He's the brother in law of Francis Scott Key. Oh, that's pretty cool. It is cool. So, so what happens is it goes up to the Supreme, basically the Supreme Court. Lincoln has suspended habeas corpus within 20 miles of all railroad tracks. But Congress says, the Constitution says only Congress can suspend habeas corpus. Right? Mm -hmm. Congress is in session. What's going Lincoln going to do? He takes it upon himself. So when Congress does come back into a special session, they go, you know what, Abe? We like what you did here, but you need to consult us first. Yeah. They think it over, and when they go to regular session this next year, they go, Abe, you've got permission if we're not in session. The whole thing plays out here. Prison camp during the Civil War. Who wrote the Star Spangled Banner? Francis Scott Key. Key. Francis Scott Key's grandson is brought here, arrested, right up here. He's here for one day. He's arrested for writing anti-Lincoln editorials in a newspaper. Imagine if something like that happened today. There's a whole, there's lots of different opinions about the government, right? Now, if you were to write something about the government, should you be arrested? No. The whole thing plays out here. All right, so what we're going to be do, we're going to hoist this flag just like they did in 1814. Now, on that morning, September 14, 1814, when this flag was taken down and the big flag was hoisted, the fife and drums played the national air, Yankee Doodle. As a former history teacher, I am shocked and appalled by how many adults have asked me why didn't they play the Star Spangled Banner. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I'm not kidding. Uh, all right, so we're going to go ahead and hoist this. Will, you want to go? All right. Now, now, when you feel the tug, let go. Everybody holding the, the hoist end. And now the after procedure. Since there is no written exact reason, 
is as you can see, we have to do it together. Just like nothing can be achieved in our country if we work alone and don't work together, we have to pull this flag as one. Great job, guys. Woo! So if anyone would like to take a picture of the flag, feel free, we're happy to